Good morning, grade sixes. I hope that you all had a wonderful weekend, that you got to relax and you got to sleep um, and that you were busy doing something really cool. It is Monday, start of a brand new week, start of exciting things to learn about. Um, and I'm here, I'm here to teach you science and I'm very excited to start our lesson. Remember that if you've got any questions throughout this lesson, please make a note of them and email them to worksheetcloud.com. Uh, this lesson is brought to you by Worksheet Cloud. So let's get started. So today we're going to be looking at dissolving. Now our previous two lessons, we were looking at solutions, part one and part two. And I hope some of you are sitting at home and you, in your head immediately, the word, when I say the word solution, you think solute, soluble, solvent, insoluble, saturated solution. And you are now familiar with all those terms um, because remember, like I said the last time, the only way to be comfortable in science is to talk science all the time. And also the more you talk about it, the more confident you are going to get, especially when it comes to writing. Okay, so let's have a look. Today we're going to look at exactly what is dissolving. Uh, we are going to look at melting versus dissolving because sometimes um, I get questions, you know, that they say, Ms. Kun, but what is the difference of melting and dissolving? Surely it's the same sort of thing. So we're going to look at, at the difference between those two. We're going to look at the rates of dissolving. Um, and the rates of dissolving specifically involves temperature, particle size, and stirring. Right. So let's start off. What exactly is dissolving? Now, boys and girls, I'm sure that there is many parts of this lesson that you probably already know. And there's many parts of this lesson that I have previously discussed in my, my, my previous two lessons. Um, and so maybe for some of you, this will be brand new. Some of you, this will be a little bit of revision. And so that's OK as well. Right. So let's look at what dissolving actually is. So the definition of dissolving is that it is when a solute breaks up from a larger crystal of molecules into, a, into much smaller groups or individual molecules. This, breaks, this breakup is caused by coming into contact with the solvent. So remember, if for example you use your sugar or you use salt, they are um, present in a larger crystal of molecule, a sugar molecule or a salt molecule. And the moment that that solute comes into contact with the solvent, it immediately starts to break up. And that sort of process we say is dissolving, right? And remember, together they form a solution. Okay, and that solution can either be a normal solution or if you add too much solute um, and the solute cannot dissolve anymore and then we call it a saturated solution. Remember, a solution also, we say, is when the solute is evenly dispersed throughout the solvent to form a solution. Your many words with S's. <laughs> okay, so now let's, let's have a look at melting versus dissolving. And I'm going to go into a little bit of uh, detail with each of them. Okay, so the first one, if we have a look at this particular picture, now this particular picture refers to melting, and I want to just talk about the different components of this picture. Now, if we have a solid, now I'm going to use water as an example, because water can take the form of a solid, a liquid, and a gas. So if we have solid uh ice cube for example now you know that the structure of a solid is that the particles of a solid are tightly packed and that's how a solid has got a fixed shape it maintains its shape in a solid the particles are tightly packed and the forces between the particles are very strong and so that's what how they're able to stay tightly packed because the forces are very strong right the moment that the solid starts to melt Okay, let me just, sorry, let me do that again. The moment that the solid starts to melt, it then melts into a liquid. So the moment that an ice cube starts to melt, it then melts into liquid water. And if you have a look at the particles over here, same particles, it just starts to um, spread out a little bit more. So the forces between the particles become a little bit weaker. So they're not as strong to keep them tightly packed and to maintain the shape of a solid. They're now a little bit weaker. 
then if you add more heat so remember every time we are adding heat it starts to change um, the forces and starts to weaken the forces between the particles and if I add more heat to the liquid and the liquid starts to evaporate through evaporation then you can see the particles are now more widely spread out and the forces between them are a lot weaker and so our liquid then evaporates into a gas and if we are talking about water it then turns into water vapor alternatively if we look at the process coming backwards and i know either in grade four or five you've done the water cycle and you've looked at solids liquids and gases in detail and the structure of them so all of this should be a little bit of revision so if we look at the gas if we um, take gas and we cool and condense gas gas then cools and condenses by condensation and then it forms into a liquid so then the um, the forces between the molecules eventually start to get a little bit stronger because remember if you think about in winter now in winter and you're very cold you stand there shivering and you don't move as much you don't have as much sort of energy when you are cold than when you are a little bit warmer and so when you are cold you don't have as much energy and that's exactly what happens so um, when you apply uh, when you drop the temperature and the temperature starts to become quite cool the gas cools and condenses to form a liquid again if i drop it even more the liquid particles start to the forces become a little bit stronger almost like they want to huddle together to keep nice and warm and then they freeze into a solid so you can see the sort of cycle of water right so melting is quite important now if we have a look at dissolving so dissolving is when it it's we um, have two or more substances that basically come together so you can see we've got our sugar molecules and it's evenly dispersed in a water molecule for some of you that are looking at this picture thinking why on earth is there one ball and two blue balls the scientific um, chemical term for water is h2o and what that means that you'll learn next year in grade seven when you learn about the periodic table of elements is that water consists of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom and together the two hydrogen and one oxygen make a, a molecule of water and so this is what this picture represents is the water and then we have the sugar so when we dissolve you when um, a substance or a solute dissolves in your solvent your sugar molecule is still there you can see it's more than one substance it's still there it is not chemically um it ha is, is still there and it's evenly dispersed throughout the solvent and we can say that it has dissolved so it's more than two substances right so just to sort of clarify the difference between melting and dissolving right now we're going to look at the rates of dissolving because dissolving if you want to dissolve a solute it can we can speed up the process by different measures so first of all if we look at the definition of rates of dissolving the rate of dissolving refers to how quickly or the time taken a solute dissolves in a solvent so does it um, dissolve really quickly or does does it take a, a little bit longer so when you talk about rate time taken so those two concepts go hand in hand right the time taken for a substance to dissolve is called the dissolving rate or another term is called the rate of dissolution right and usually if we want to look at the rates of dissolving we would have a timer we would time it to see that the moment that all of the particles of that solute is completely dissolved um, and the time that it took for that to happen would be the rate of dissolving and um, for all of the particles to completely disappear and evenly spread out themselves or disperse themselves within the solvent then the rate of which a substance dissolves can be affected by three factors so we look at temperature temperature can affect the rates of dissolving whether the solution is stirred or not and we can also look at the grain size of the solute so i'm going to quickly go into detail of all three now the first one that we're going to look at is actually the temperature now what i want you to do boys and girls is that as i go through the different um 
components of the rates of dissolving remember that you are at home you can try all of these out i want you to really explore um conduct little experiments for yourself at home with com with the complete scientific method okay so what is your question of your experiment let's determine whether uh, a sugar will dissolve in cold water, whether it will dissolve in warm water, for example, or salt, or look at sugar uh, or coffee granules or something. Um, but I want you to really explore and experiment at home. You can using the things that you've got at home. So this is just a diagram to show you. We've got three different diagrams. We've got a beaker here filled with ice water. We've got a beaker with room temperature, water at room temperature, and we've got a beaker with hot water and the picture clearly shows us it is hot because there's some steam that is coming off the water. Now a solute will generally dissolve faster if the solvent in which it dissolves is warm. So I want all of you to go um, look in your kitchen, get two glasses, maybe boil the kettle, uh, put, a t remember the water level must be the same, so our variable is the same, our water is exactly the same. Um, have two glasses, the same qu uh, quantity of water in each, uh, have the same teaspoon, level teaspoon of sugar or salt, put one in hot water, put one in cold water, and then see, time it to see, okay, which one's going to dissolve faster if the one is, if the one water is hot and the other one is cold. So I want you to really explore, taste this all out. Um, and then you can come to your own conclusions. And then eventually you might want to once you've got the results of that little experiment, you might want to then test the experiment from a different aspect. What if I um, add heat and stirring or whatnot? And that then brings me on to our second uh, component of our rate of dissolving. And that is our particle size. Now, again, this is something that you can do at home. Now, a lot of you, some of you have got uh, coarse salt grains at home and some of you have got fine salt. Again, if I compare the size of the particle, if I've got particles that are much bigger, such as your coarse salt, compared to particles that are much smaller, such as your fine salt, and I have it in water, exact, maybe room temperature water, exactly the water of the same temperature, exactly the same quantity of water give it a stir but of my two different particle sizes which part which solute is going to dissolve quicker right and so again test this out explore ask questions but you can try it out so you have the capacity of trying uh, doing a little experiment at home uh, testing out temperature and now particle size and thirdly you can do one with stirring. If we stir a solution, it also um, increases the rate of dissolving um, when a solution is, sh is either stirred or shaken. If you've got a lid of something and you shake it all up, it also does increase the rate at which that solute will dissolve and it will make it go a little bit quicker. And so you can see with the picture, if you don't, if you're not stirring, uh, there's a solution with no stirring. You can see that the solute is still gathered at the bottom of your beaker. And if you are stirring, it does assist. So for the two experiments that I did in my previous two lessons, the first one testing soluble or insoluble substances, and yesterday on Friday testing the uh, a saturated solution, you would have noticed that I did stir both in both experiments to sort of increase the time and again try it out I want you to try it out you can do your three experiments following your scientific method what is your question what is your hypothesis list your variables of your experiment what are your materials or apparatus that you are going to use what is your method step-by-step -step method then have your stopwatch ready take notes okay Start your experiment and see, take your time, put it in a table of results, maybe create a graph. Then what can we conclude based on those results? And then always to end off a scientific method is to reflect what worked, what didn't work. Was it a flop? Was it a success? And remember, if something is a success or a flop, what can we learn from it? What can we change from that experiment to do something different in the future? What can we enhance or improve the experiment? And so this is why science is so exciting, because 
there's so many different angles that you can always test or you you can experiment to sort of get different questions and to just expand your knowledge and your thinking so please i encourage all of you to do these experiments um, especially now that you're at home and try it out and see what happens so boys and girls that brings me to the end of our science lesson for today remember i hope that all of you are staying safe that you are healthy um, and that you're happy and that you have all had a wonderful weekend and that you really to you're excited to learn in all your different subjects this week and to con continually uh, just grow your knowledge and to ask questions and to just learn have a wonderful monday uh, this lesson was brought to you by Worksheet Cloud from me, Ms. Kun. Um, Hakuna Matata, be kind to one another. Bye.